Welcome to the lecture for April 3rd, Friday. Continuing on with our topic of marine ecosystems. We've been looking at nearshore ecosystems, intertidal, moving offshore to the continental shelf. We've got this last one that could be considered coastal, most of these shallow water, fringing continents or islands. Coral reef ecosystems. There is a lot of interest in coral reef ecosystems. Coral reefs are very productive, very diverse, a lot of different species, a huge amount of production, a lot of different niches that are filled. Very interesting. A lot of people interested in coral reefs. Even here in Rhode Island, you'd think that URI is quite a long ways away from corals, which it is, but we've got a number of different people that study corals, including in the Department of Biological Sciences and the College of Environment and Life Sciences, which many of you are in. So we're going to talk about these 10 topics for corals, coral reef ecosystems, which, as you notice, is more than most of these ecosystems. Talk about the open ocean, which is a huge part of the ocean. We'll also have quite a few topics. So to begin with, as I was saying, you don't find corals off the coast of Rhode Island. Coral, the animal, they have certain environmental characteristics that they require. And so if you look on a map, and I'll show you a map in a minute. If you look at a map of the distribution of corals around the world, and for the most part, there's a few exceptions that I'll point out a couple of those. For the most part, you're only going to find corals, coral reefs, and coral reef ecosystems between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. If you look at the water temperature where these corals are, it's typically warmer than 18 degrees Celsius, which is close to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, a little less and they're found in these warm temperatures related to their ability to grow, to deposit calcium carbonate in their skeletons. And you find corals along the margins of continents, a lot more along the western margins than the eastern margins of continents. And they're in shallow water because of the this photosynthetic organisms that they have, the symbiotic relationship that they have with dinoflagellates, where the corals obtain a lot of their energy from photosynthesis, not from photosynthesis that they're doing. They're animals. They don't photosynthesize, but from these photosynthetic dinoflagellates that they have this symbiotic relationship with, incorporated into their tissues. Since a lot of their energy is derived from photosynthesis, then by necessity, they've got to be in water shallow enough for light to penetrate, and so they're found in shallow water. And they're found in clear water. Things that interfere with light penetration, like turbidity, bad, bad for corals. Depth, where light is attenuated, bad, bad for corals because it's bad for photosynthesis, bad for the dinoflagellates that are in their tissues. Now, here's a map. You can find many of these online that show the red dots, the distribution of corals around the world. And it's also conveniently got this 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. So you look in the Atlantic off the U.S. east coast, there's Bermuda, which is at 32 degrees north, just a little ways north. There's some other places a little farther north or south than 30 degrees, but for the most part within this band, and again, related to temperature, sunlight that's required for photosynthesis and for the deposition of calcium carbonate. Some of you might go to Bermuda. URI has this exchange program at BIOS in Bermuda, quite popular. Sometimes there's been 14 or 15 URI students studying there in the fall semesters. Well, as I mentioned, 
One of the interesting things about coral, the animals, is that they have these dinoflagellates. They have a photosynthetic organism embedded in their tissues. Now, that's pretty unusual for a, an animal. And so in terms of primary production, there is a lot of sunlight. There's a lot of nutrients. Very good combination for photosynthesis. There's also a lot of uh, filtration that takes place. The corals are filter feeders, and so are other organisms. They're filter feeding food out of the water column. Little small things, sponges, are filter feeders as well. We saw there's a number of filter feeders. It's a very productive ecosystem, a huge amount of energy. With all this energy, there's a lot of energy to go around for organisms. There's, it's this three-dimensional, sometimes 100 meters of three-dimensional, very complex habitat, a lot of niches to be filled. And so, <clears throat> with all these microhabitats and all these niches and all this energy, it's an extremely diverse ecosystem. And by that, I mean that there are a lot of different species, thousands of different species of invertebrates and fish and other vertebrates as well. Snakes, reptiles, and uh, marine mammals in some cases. The producers in this case, you may have noticed that there's been an emphasis on the primary producers in each one of these ecosystems that we've looked at. Who are the primary producers? Are they plants in some cases? Are they algae? In some cases, if you think about the rocky shore and the mud flats and a few other places, are they phytoplankton? Some, some of these ecosystems that we're looking at, the primary producers are phytoplankton. Well, every ecosystem that we look at, with the exception of one, the deep sea, has some primary producers. Algae, plants, phytoplankton for the most part. Well, in this case... There's a huge amount of primary production. One might wonder, well, where are all the primary producers? In the coral. I don't see that much algae. There's some algae. I certainly don't see any plants. And there's not that much phytoplankton there. Well, the primary producers are these zoosanthella, which are dinoflagellates. They're photosynthetic dinoflagellates that are incorporated into the tissues of the coral. These animals have little photosynthetic organisms in their tissues. It's quite an amazing symbiotic relationship. That's where all this primary production comes from. So in terms of these zoosanthella, there's a lot of different species of coral. Some of these species don't have zoosanthella in their tissues, but the reef-building corals that we're talking about we're focusing most of our attention on, they find in the tropics, do have these zoosanthella. So there's the hermatypic corals and the other ones that don't have these tissues. And these photosynthetic organisms, again, are dinoflagellates, which are single-celled protists. They're not plants. They're protista. Same, it's kind of archaic these days, but it's the same group as algae, not plants. And if you look in the tissues of coral, there are a lot of these zoosanthella, these little single-celled microscopic dinoflagellate primary producers. Could be a million per square centimeter. So they require light, they require nutrients, and this is a symbiotic relationship. In fact, it's a classic symbiotic relationship. And by symbiotic relationship, I mean that both parties benefit. The corals, they provide a home and they provide nutrients. You think about things that photosynthetic organisms need. They need nitrogen, they need phosphate, they need carbon. And so the corals provide those nutrients, plus they provide a home that's shallow enough water for photosynthesis to take place, for light to be available. 
and the zoosanthella provide to the coral food. The zoosanthella are primary producers. They're taking light energy and converting it to chemical energy in the form of some storage form of sugar, basically. Well, they're doing that for themselves, but they're also giving some of that primary production products to the coral itself. In fact, the coral gets uh, quite a bit of its energy from these zoosanthella. Algae is another name for these, these uh, dinoflagellates. So the dinoflagellates, they're producing a lot more food than they need. It's used by the coral. They're producing a lot more carbon, fixed carbon in the form of sugar, than they need. And the coral get most of that energy. The coral, again, they're filter feeders. They have the nematocyst, the stinging cells. They're filtering the water, but they don't derive the majority of their energy. From feeding, they derive a lot of their energy from the zoosanthella. So it's a win-win situation for both parties in this symbiotic relationship. A lot of different types of corals. If you go around and classify the, there's a lot of different species in the Pacific. In the Atlantic, not as many. And these are Nidaria that we looked at a long time ago. So they're Anthozoa. Closely related to jellyfish, anemones, and uh, these relatively primitive animals. Now, when I asked you guys, what's the most important invertebrate phyla? I'd say about a third of you chose Nidaria. Now, it's not necessarily because of anemones or jellyfish or hydra that you chose Nidaria. The, the explanation for them being so important almost all, every time was coral, the importance of coral in marine ecosystems. And it's certainly a legitimate answer because these reef-forming coral, they, they provide, they produce, they're responsible for it, this very, very productive, very, very diverse, very, very dynamic ecosystem, specialized ecosystem that's widespread, and at least in the tropics, in the subtropics, it's a it's a huge ecosystem. Some places, at least along the the, the perimeter of land, continents and islands. So you can look at this and see how they they're uh, Nidaria, and then there's these different kinds of corals. There's soft corals, there's hard corals, there's these uh, different classification, a lot of different species. And in terms of their structure, we'll have to go back and, and look at this medusa and polyp stage. Remember that? The medusa and polyp in Nidaria, that there, there's the jellyfish is the prototypical medusa stage that's swimming around, free swimming. And uh, an anemone coral is the prototypical polyp stage, where it's like a jellyfish in a way that's upside down and on its back and stuck onto the some hard substrate. These reef-forming corals, which are the ones that everybody's interested in, which are the ones that generate this huge ecosystem, they deposit calcium carbonate in their skeleton. And on top of the skeleton are the little coral polyps. They're relatively small. And they're colonial. There's a whole bunch of different individual organisms, individual organism, individual coral that are form part of these these colonies. And if you look at the an individual polyp, one of these little corals, and you look in their little tentacles, then you find millions of these zoosanthella. And if you look at these corals, if you look at these pictures, they have the stinging cells, they have the nematocysts, they're waving those back and forth in the water. Water's flowing across these they're certainly capable of filter feeding. Here's some structural diagrams that show how these corals 
work. Now, you can look at corals as those little polyps, which they are. If you zoom in on a coral, that's what they look like. But they also they have these structures that we're a lot more familiar with, this hard substrate, this hard skeleton, basically made up of calcium carbonate. Their skeleton, which has these polyps on top of it. So there's a diagram there of the, the left of this uh, little cone-like structure upon which you find a polyp. There, they have tentacles with those stinging cells, the nematocysts, as you can see in the diagram up there. And they have this typical polyp type of body design that we saw way back when we were looking at the, the radio symmetry of nadarians. Now here's some different views. There's a coral. There's some fish swimming in the very top picture cartoon. In the middle one, showing this little cross section of one of the tentacles of one coral polyp. And if you look closely at that tentacle, then you see the, the animal, the corals themselves, and you can see all these little, you may not be able to see it that well in your, in your, your video, but in slides, it's this greenish colored. They're filled with zoosanthella, the photosynthetic organisms. And, and in a real picture, you can see a little polyp tentacle of a coral and little dots in that up in the uh, upper right hand side where it says zoosanthella. Those little dots are little zoosanthella, the photosynthetic dinoflagellates. So that's what their, their organization of their body, that their skeleton with the polyps on top of it, with the dinoflagellates embedded in their tissues. Now there's a lot of different species of corals, as you saw, a lot of different morphological features that are really related to where they're found, how much water movement there is, how much light there is. And so rather than going through, spending any time looking at all these different species, we can look at some different types of corals based on their morphology, basically. And so some of them look like flower. They have a name like a flower. Some of them look like a big rock. They have a name like a rock. Some of them have branches like a tree. They've got names like those. Our antlers, or they look like a table, but they're low and flat. All of those names, these eight different types, are very descriptive. So quickly... We'll go through and look at these different types of corals. Now you have, if you're look, doing this phylogenetically rather than morphologically, then you it would be scattered all over the place. You'd have some that are closely related that have different morphologies and some that have similar morphologies that aren't so closely related. So like I said, we'll quickly go through this. These uh, eight different types and First of all are the encrusting ones up there in picture number one. You can see it looks like a, a mat, a film that's, that's laid over the top of some substrate, some hard substrate. There's massive corals. They look like a big boulder, a big, big shape where you can imagine what the water movement is like there. This is where there's going to be strong currents, strong waves. You don't want all these little fine particles branches that can be broken off so massive they don't grow that quickly but they certainly withstand a lot of water movement then there's this foliace foliage it's like a flower the flower petals and so it looks kind of like a flower big surface area for photosynthesis and the absorption of light but pretty delicate can be broken pretty easily so you're not going to find those and really Areas where there's a lot of strong wave action. There's a number of types of corals that are branching. They have a bunch of branches. It increases the surface area in a different way than a big flat area like the foliase ones. So there's a pretty big surface area for absorption of light. But it's relatively strong. So you could imagine some waves crashing. These types of corals would be able to withstand that, that wave action. Some other types. There's columnar. What do you know? They look like columns. Picture number one. There's 
elk horn. They look like antlers of elk, similar to branching, a little more fragile surface area increased for light absorption. Then you've got mushroom ones. They are shaped like mushrooms. What do you know? They have a relatively big surface area, but they're pretty robust and they can withstand strong wave action. They don't have little parts that are out that can be broken apart. And then you've got these table-like corals. So the numbers here, you see there's five, six, seven, eight, and then the picture is one, two, three, four. Well, five is number one and six is number two. You can figure that out. I should probably change those numbers. But the point is the table, the big table, big surface area, delicate, could be broken. You're going to find these in calmer water, not in areas where there's a lot of wave action. Then the last thing I want to look at today, well, this first lecture, is growth, the growth of corals. Corals grow relatively slowly. It takes a long time for corals to grow. Some places they grow pretty quickly. And they're always growing up. They're always growing towards the light. They've got this skeleton, calcium carbonate on the bottom, the polyp is on the top. Then this calcium carbonate skeleton is always going up towards the surface, towards the light. They're getting higher, and we'll see that a lot of places where these corals are found, they're battling an island sinking. So they're trying to grow up and keep up with the island sinking to remain where there's light. So growth is obviously affected by their ability to obtain energy. They're doing this through photosynthesis, not themselves the amount of energy that they derive from these dinoflagellates. What kind of things interfere with that? They're also fil filter feeding, but what really limits their growth rate is light and primary production by the dinoflagellates. So currents can affect light intensity, moving things around and creating some turbidity depth, turbidity sediments, sedimentation, water temperature, and, and day length, all of those things are affecting to one degree or another how much light reaches the coral and how quickly the corals grow, how much energy they have to channel towards growth. Just want to look at this really quick short animation that talks about the coral growth. A coral lava There's a little coral polyp floating sea, around. Floating in a soup of young reef animals. Fertilized egg going to develop into larvae. They're, they develop in these larvae stages just like all these other invertebrates do and fish do. So this little cor fertilized egg developing into a larva, survives, that's what the narration is here. It's going to settle onto the substrate. These coral larvae usually don't travel larva very far. It's all and becomes a polyp, similar to computer a generated, but it's showing these little co coral polyps growing. They're depositing their the calcium carbonate in their skeleton, this coral spreading Each polyp vertically and for the hard horizontally as well. And from this solid base begins to grow. So these corals are growing quickly, obviously. Now, some of this is probably real footage. Growing towards the light. It increases in length by an impressive 15 centimeters a year. And these are this colonial. In those, there old. are a bunch of little polyps. Reef. And then in the end, you have got a, a whole coral reef. Different types. Branching corals, elkhorn corals, table corals, foliace corals. A lot of different types. Corals provide the foundations well, this is the kind of place you're going to go swimming, snorkeling, relies. scuba diving Some organisms to see like all this coral diversity. Actually live and this coral. that's not a coral, but there's organisms that live in the symbiotic relationships with corals as well as the dinoflagellates. Others climb out away from the reef 